All right. Uh, next up, we've uh, Peter Chubb, who's doing a talk on uh, well, is Linux getting slower? Uh, so, uh, Peter. Hi. This talk started when uh, a colleague of mine, Godfrey, who's really interested in statistics, wanted to work out whether his benchmarks, which were very noisy, actually showed a slowdown or a speed up or the same. So we worked out some statistical tests, and we were going to present that in the main conference. And then he realized his green card was about to expire, so he had to dash off to the US and couldn't come to this conference. So you don't miss out on all the benchmarking I did. This was uh, motivated by a statement that Linus made about a year and a half ago at LinuxCon in 2009. The point is, um, it's a bit sad that Linux isn't the streamlined kernel that he originally envisaged. I remember when it was faster than anything else I had, and I could outperform our Solaris big spark box with a 486 running at 50 megahertz. That's no longer true. So how do we measure performance? This is a standard system performance graph. It's uh, the, the shape of it was analyzed by a fellow called Neil Gunther. And if you look on Wikipedia under the universal performance law, you'll find out all about it. Basically, it's got three bits. In this part here, throughput is roughly proportion to the number of jobs you give it. So you give it a job, it finishes, and then it goes into idle for a bit. You give another job, it finishes, you get another, you know. So, so the rate at which jobs complete, the vertical axis, is approximately proportional to the rate at which you give jobs to it. Up here, you start to get a bit of a slowdown. Well, what's happening there is some critical resource is beginning to be a bit contended. So instead of a job arriving, running, and finishing, and then getting out of there, a job arrives, and it's queued behind some other job that's on the processor. And it's got to wait for the queuing time as well as the running time. So you end up start, starting to go along this way here. Eventually, the curve starts coming down again. What's happening there is your jobs are running, and they're running at whatever rate the queues will allow them. But when a new job arrives, it steals some time from some resource that's needed to make forward progress. So the act of putting in more jobs actually steals time from the forward progress one, so you get lower performance. OK. So what I wanted to do was run the AIM-7 benchmark on as many different kernel versions as I could afford the time for over as a reasonably long period of time. First thing I had to do was find a machine that would run all the kernels from, say, 2615 up to the present. Second, I had to find a user space that would run all those kernels. <laughs> Thank you. The AIM-7 benchmark is it's configurable. It aims to um, emulate a whole heap of uh, people hammering on a machine. Um, doing different things. So, so the idea is that it emulates n users. And, it, and the way that I run it is you increase the number of emulated users until the performance start, per user starts going down massively. There are two benchmarks, two workloads I used. One was a database-like workload. That's got a reasonable amount of uh, um, I.O. in it. And the other one was a high system load benchmark, which doesn't do any disk I.O., but does do a lot of stuff that has at least 50% CPU time, uh, system time, kernel time. Right? And I also ran LMBench, which is a micro benchmark that tests lots of different things individually. So, come on. Yeah, this was the machine I used. It's a Pentium 4 running at 2 gigahertz, 2.5 gigahertz. It's got a relatively slow disk. Uh, running user, user space was to be an old stable. So um, that was really nice, because it would run all with, with all those kernels. It doesn't use UDEV. And that meant I could turn off iNotify and get 10% performance boost. Yay! We used the CFQIO scheduler. I rebuilt the file system between tests so that disk fragmentation wouldn't be an issue. And as close as possible, I used the same kernel configuration for all of the things we use. So the new database workload, about 20% of the workload hits the disk. And that's important, as we'll see. The kinds of things it does is copy files together, call sync, create file, read files, reread files, um, write to file, open to osync, um, does page faults, does some CPU intensive stuff, all of those things. And for 2615, this is the way the curve looked. 
Again, along the bottom, you've got the number of users, uh, simulated users. Up the side, you've got the jobs completed per minute. And it follows the curve pretty well with a very steep beginning part, some jaggies there, which are reproducible. I don't exactly explain, understand why. And then it starts going down. So that was 2615, about 2006, about four years ago. 2620, about a year later. This time, we get a much bigger heap, peak, but you've got to put a lot more work on it to get to that peak. So for ordinary users who don't stress their machine and run them at 100% of capacity all the time, they're getting less performance. Again, you've got jaggies, which are almost exactly the same places, but lower. I don't know why, still. But you've also got this flat bit, um, which ends at 42. <laughs> I can't explain that one either, and I'll come to that in a minute. So 2620, we're getting slightly better performance overall, but uh, for normal use cases, we're getting lower performance. So let's go to 2625. Now, we're peaking a lot lower. For ordinary users, we're getting even worse. Can you see the pattern beginning to emerge? Let's go to 2630, a year later again. This one, it's about the same as 2620 for ordinary use, but the peak is still lower. 2635, a few months ago. Yeah? Here. And here. So it looks like, from this workload at least, this is the database workload, that Linux is getting slower. I should note that if you just take two-point versions, 35, 36, and run them, the, the, the lines overlap to an extent that you can't actually tell that there's any slowdown between these ones. Right? So if you go 2615, 2616, the lines overlap to the extent that the, the standard deviation bars overlap, and you can't really tell without doing some fairly sophisticated uh, statistical tests. It's slab all the way through. Um, because I don't think slab existed in 2615. Yeah, yeah. Nope, nope. Like I said, I've tried as far as possible to keep the configuration exactly the same. So in these ones, I'm not using Live ATA. I'm still using the old driver. Because that would be yet another layer. Right? So what's going on? Later kernels are giving me worse performance. I hate this. There was a massive jump between 2620 and 2625. What happened? I don't know. I go through the logs, and there's thousands of changes there. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. The kinks of all the eight job boundaries. If we go back to that one, that one's at 42. That one's at 24. So is the number eight embedded in the I.O. scheduler somewhere? It is. Ooh. I'm using CFQ. CFQ batches things in eight request lots. So if the jobs happen to be queuing eight at a time, and so maybe that's it. So I tried again with deadline, which doesn't do that. I'd get exactly the same behavior with exactly the same kinks. I'm hoping that you people can tell me what's going on. So something else is happening. What is it? All right. There's two things going on. There's kernel system time, and there's I.O. stuff. So let's try running with the high system time benchmark. This has no file system activity, but lots of things all of which have at least half their time spent in the kernel. And we get this curve. That's just the two endpoints, 2615, 2635. So it's not that. It's something in the I.O., the block I.O. system that's going on. So I have an O profile. After Linus said it might be cache footprint, I tried with cache misses and see approximately the same number of cache misses for each one. So it's not that. This is just cycles. And what we'll see is the total kernel time for 2615 is about 1%. The total kernel time for 2635 is about 8%. And we're spending a long time in memset and sync inodes, SB, which is the thing that actually syncs the inodes out to the disk. Right back. <laughs> right back. So try the LM bench. The LM bench gives you lots of micro benchmarks. And most things are getting better. I mean, two, Context switching is a bit slower. File creation is a bit slower. <laughs> File deletion is a bit slower. Page faults are faster. But the standard deviation of 18 
means that I don't know how much, I need to do a st student t-test on it to find out whether it's really a difference or not. Well, I didn't do that. So everything's getting slower. So the problem's somewhere in the VM, the block layer, the VFS of the XT3, and I really suspect it's the VM write back stuff. But I don't know that for sure. What I'm really alarmed about is that I haven't seen anything written about this by anybody else. Is nobody else running AIM-7 with the database workloads? Any people from Oracle here? And I sort of ran out of time for any further investigation. So my caveats, this was just on one system. It's an older system. It's UP. Other workloads will give different results. And nowadays, our kernel runs on far more different machines. It scales an awful lot better than it did in 2615. 2615, the SGI was just beginning their work to try and scale to 1,024 processors. Um, we go beyond that now by a long way. And we're somewhat, well, <laughs> a different bug set from what that was there. So where to now? Well, uh, this is a plea to anybody who puts patch sets and patches in the kernel. I never, never, never want to see the words, it's down in the noise for a difference, unless you've done student T or similar, to check that the, there is really no statistical difference. And we really need better ways to evaluate the performance feature trade-offs so that when we put new features in, we know what the performance is, the performance cost is. And that's going to mean lots more benchmarking. The, the problem with benchmarking, though, is it takes an awful long time. Each of those curves took a day and a bit to produce. So, yeah. So has anybody got any comments about this? Yeah? Sorry, can you speed up? Perhaps we do need an automated system that runs things. There is a group that's doing that. I can't remember what they're called, but they do try running um, benchmarks and picking up regressions fairly soon after a new stable kernel's released. But I don't think they run this benchmark. Otherwise, I would have seen this. They don't really care about universes or either. No, that's true. Yeah. And uh, I, I, the, the, the multi-process of performance on 2615 sucked anyway, so I wasn't going to try it. comment is that uh, because I didn't reconfigure things to use the latest um, versions of things like slab versus slub or the, the newer on-disk format for EXT3 compared with the 2615 one, we're unfairly disadvantaging the newer kernels. And I think that's a fair point. It's just that uh, from the point of view of being able to reproduce the results, it's important to keep things as close as possible to the same. If, we, if I'd make massive changes, I would also have had to change user space to take advantage of those things, um, you know, newer glibcs to take advantage of newer interfaces. And as soon as you do that, which they have, yeah. Slab versus slab is all internal. Um, the newer on disk format for XT3 is all internal. Um, but there are some others that aren't. So, yeah. Yes. This was exactly what our talk was about. Uh, Godfrey has developed such a tool. In, 
and uh, uh, there's a script available, and, uh, but you need to run the things more like 30 times than three times to get significance because of the law of large numbers. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, as far as that bit's concerned, that bit's easy. Um, we, we produced that and put it up on our wiki about uh, ooh, five years ago. And um, there's an LMB sum Perl script, which we modified to make it work. Um, uh, and you run your um, LM bench as many times as you want, you know, 4 vex in backtick, 130 backtick. And then. Um, uh, run the make C pipes through Perl, LMBench dot Perl, and then it will give you a um, the standard deviation and the number of runs for each of the means that's produced. Yeah. Yes. The comment is that some of the distro vendors, such as SUSE, have uh, stabilized an early version, kernel version, such as 2.6.16, backpointed and cherry picked patches that come forward and made sure their user base still works with it. Uh, and so that may have some way of uh, finding out what the problem is. I don't know. I suspect. It's two six mid tens. You know, everyone has big, has, does know mm. this, but nobody's figured out what or who, who's fault yeah. is first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, David's comment is that we're probably fitting, hitting the right back problem that everyone knows about, but nobody wants to um, talk about very much. Um, the, the, the problem with that theory is um, I'd expect the right back problem to have been introduced. And then, you know, and then all the rest of them be more or less the same place. Yeah. But, but here we see, what's happened to my thing, pointer? Yeah. But here we're just seeing a continual degradation. Yeah. So there's something else going on as well. But the last, I suppose they should shift that one back. I think, I, you know, I would guess the right back started after a red one. Yeah, like that's right. But, that so bad yes, that's change. right. That's where I suspect the problem is, yeah. there. But after that, there's still a problem and there's something else going on. And any of the problems, this is a general rule. With performance issues, you, you solve one, and it's like peeling an onion. You p solve one, and you get to the next layer of the onion. Yeah, up the back there. There's only three problems. There's three performance problems there. Well, there you go. And I'm not saying that I know what those problems are. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yes, I'll agree with that. There are three problems, um, and it could be that the iCache footprint is going up there. Uh, I couldn't see any evidence from that in the O profile results.
Yeah, they're, they're smallish. But they are reproducible. They're real. And um, the, the problem is that uh, I haven't put the results up because I didn't have time to run enough runs to make it statistically significant, but 36 and 36 RC5 was even worse again. And go backwards. <laughs> It doesn't help. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. Yeah. Down. Yeah. Anyway, I'm hoping you found that interesting.